Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you, Pinky. Uh, really good to be here. Really good to join you all. I've already learned a bunch of things watching some some of the great talks that have come on. So, uh, yeah, I I am. I was thinking about what to present here. So, I am the lead for Tag App Delivery in CNCF. It's a group where we review projects coming in uh, and try to find synergies and standards and and improve collaboration between all the CNCF projects. Um, in particular, I lead a group there called the Platforms Working Group. Uh, and the past couple of years, we've been trying to provide guidance and support enterprises, companies, people trying to adopt platform engineering mindset, uh, implement platforms, cloud platforms in their organizations. So I thought today uh, I would I would talk about uh, what what those what that guidance is, and in particular, uh, I wanted to tell a story uh, around platform engineering because I, I it's what it really is, is it comes down to a lot, a lot of relationships um, at, at the core of the culture of platform engineering. Of course, there's the, the practical, technical aspect, but there's a lot of cultural aspect also. Um, so I wanted to talk today about how we build bridges as platform engineers, as, as platform builders. And we'll relate that to some of the work that the, that the group has done. So... I call this talk building bridges with platforms because I wanted to kind of play on that idea. Uh, when we look at a bridge, a bridge kind of brings together two points, um, dev on one side and ops on the other. No, whatever, so point A and point B, it connects two points. Um, and that's a that's a start. But when we, when we look at what a platform team has to do, um, yeah, of course they interact with application development and they provide and we'll talk about that they provide capabilities for application developers. But then they also need to interact with the security team. They need to interact with the product management team that's determining uh, what, what kind of products they're going to be building and, and what kind of support they need. Um, there's sales and marketing that need to influence uh, what, what activities are going to be happening in the company. And then, of course, you've got the C-suite that has strategic concerns. How is this going to increase our increase our company's value? How are we going to sell more products? Uh, you've got vendors and service providers to work with. So pretty fast, you on the platform team, uh, it's going to start looking more a bit like this, um, continuing the going with uh, with trains and railroads. Uh, so this is a roundhouse. We've got a lot of multiple connections that have to be made. And even to round out the, the conversation and, and take it to a full platform. Here's a platform inside a train station. All the trains coming in together, all of them meeting each other, all of them going back out to other destinations um, from this hub. So a platform really, uh, it's not just a bridge, really. And that was that's kind of the, the pun that I'm playing on. Um, the platforms build bridges in many directions, and it ends up being more, more a hub, more a platform like this. So why is that? Um, this kind of ties back. So, so our group put out has put out two two pieces of uh, of guidance so far. Uh, one of them is, and I'll, and I'll share a link at the end so everyone can find it. Uh, one of them is to help platform product managers, platform builders advocate for their platform and describe the, the benefits of it and what it is. Um, and in that paper, we kind of describe a platform as something that abstracts a whole lot of capabilities in a consistent, uh, coherent way that pre to present them to developers. Um, and it's really because of that, here's here's the uh, a well-known diagram from our first paper, because of that um, integration asset, because you're bringing together, let's say 10, 15, 20 different capabilities for your product teams to integrate into their applications, uh, it becomes a a point of a hub point, a point where people can come together. Um, so yeah, so just going over how we define platforms in that first paper, we we viewed them as an integrated collection of capabilities, you know, pulled from many different places, but in particular with an eye to the need of the platform user. Um, yeah, so check out that paper. It goes further in depth on why this is beneficial. Uh, some of the some of the advantages to reducing cognitive load, 
uh, to increasing compliance. That's all mentioned in this in this first paper. Um, yeah, so I wanted to now get into what we've been working on the past six months, which has been basically we have that first paper where we described why platforms are valuable, uh, what a platform might be made of. We talked about capabilities, like we saw on the last slide, that uh, that that big list or uh, a big diagram there of capabilities that you might include. But the biggest ask, and we, we published that in April, the biggest ask was, okay, we kind of see where this is beneficial to us, but how do we go about uh, achieving this? How can we put in a platform where we're going to reduce the cognitive load like you promised, where we're going to increase our developers' productivity and experience? Uh, where we're going to be sure we have the governance and compliance and the guardrails that, that we need for our enterprise. So, uh, happily, um, around the same time as we published that first paper, there was an initial maturity model created by Sintasso and some of our colleagues uh, there that also participate in, in, the, in TAG App Delivery and CNCF and our working group. And so they put out an initial uh, maturity model and then they turned it over to our group and said, hey, can you guys go over this, um, mature the maturity model together uh, and, and publish it via the group? And it was a perfect fit because like I said, we needed to help people understand how they could achieve that vision that we're, we're trying to pitch. Um, yeah, I just realized. And the reason why we wanna, we really do believe that by achieving these platforms by implementing a platform engineering culture, by implementing a, a platform in your org or several platforms in your organization, you will get more benefit from cloud and you will accelerate um, your product, your product value, your product delivery. So we created this maturity model, which is I want to dive into this now a little bit more. Um, and I want to dive into it from a perspective of relationships. So in the, in the model, we've got five aspects. Um, which there were about 50 to 50 to 60 people that went over this this summer, uh, contributed and, and helped us narrow down these aspects. The people came from, you know, vendors like, like myself at Red Hat or Sintasso, but also from end user companies, um, from cloud companies. We had a lot of contributors, a lot of insight. We ended up with these five key aspects to start with, at least. We're always open to feedback, always agile. Um, and we'll go into each one, investment, adoption, interfaces, operations, measurement. And then we'll talk about the continuum in each one uh, that, that you can look to. And we'll give some examples. So let's start out with investment and measurement. Um, what do we mean by those? And who are the relationships that are affected? So you got your platform team. Investment to us, the way we defined it, and I'll read the question here, how are staff and funds allocated to platforms, to platform capabilities? So how do you, you know, do you hire engineers? Do you hire product managers? Do you hire developer advocates? Do you have a support team? Um, so how do you hire and how do you allocate people to this team? You know, do you just ad hoc ask people from application teams to, to participate and to contribute the, the features that they need? Um, so from the perspective of people, from the perspective of funding, uh, you know, probably the most interesting point in all of these is, is the transition from operational to scalable, the transition from number two to number three. So for example, in investment, we see that at level two, we have a dedicated team, which means I've allocated a team that's building the components that I need for my application developers. But the difference between that and as a product is that I'm not judging them based on the value that they provide to those end users. They're more, I, I guess you might say a cost center. Um, their value, you know, that they're providing to the enterprise is not as clear because they're just funded as, you know, take care of this, take care of this, uh, of this necessary business rather than you are providing an active value as a product, uh, to our, to our end developers. Um, so some examples on that, I, I actually talked to, to an engineer at a company that is a pretty well-known company that has a good platforms team and they even have some support engineers on their platform team. And this person told me, I built a, a data visualization tool 
which anybody can use to, you know, take a Jupyter notebook and publish, uh, publish some statistics really quickly, visualizations. But I have to maintain it myself and people have to come to me and I can barely keep it up. And, you know, it's just this one thing that's being used by five or six teams and I want to build it up more. And I was, it was interesting to me to find within one organization, that's why I wanted to bring it as an example. You could be on, you could have different teams, different platform-like teams or, or functionality uh, at different stages in this investment line. Um, I, I mentioned, I, I talked to one company that even has product support that, you know, that always is impressive, pretty advanced maturity level there. If you've got, uh, if you've got support and your, your people that are actually writing code platform engineers, um, moving on to the next category measurement. So talking about, so of course, investment is a lot, the platform team's relationship with the strategy and the C-suite and convincing them to, to invest and to keep going and to maintain that that team. Um, measurement, this, you know, this is a, a really active space of conversation in our in our space right now in platform engineering. How do we, and, and this one, you could argue that it's it, it actually relates to a few, in a few different ways. I'm gonna emphasize the relationship with the, the, the C-suite. I need to, you know, me as platform engineer, us as platform engineers, you wanna show, the C-suite that you are having the impact that you desire. So measurement is towards them, but it's also towards your app teams, your product teams. Um, you know, they want to know that they're going to be able to deliver faster uh, if they get on your platform. Maybe it's the engineer's first question isn't, how is the business going to make more money? Uh, that might be more the strategy question, uh, but they definitely want to see your measurements too. And to some degree, you also want to measure yourself, of course. Um, but this is a very interesting space because a lot of the metrics we have, and I just saw a conversation in the platform engineering Slack about this. Like, let's say, let's take the Dora metrics. Dora metrics are things like how frequently you make a new release, um, how frequently that release fails, how long it takes to get the release out. Um, that doesn't directly say that the product that you're releasing is so valuable, of course. I'm sure we all realize that. But what we've discovered is that these correlate with good quality products with productive engineering teams. Um, so we found correlation. I saw some other uh, some other advice in that thread in the platform engineering Slack um, that you could relate it to the time saved if you wanted to actually give a money number for your C-suite. You know, the, the number of developer hours saved, the number of developers you don't have to hire because you have a more efficient platform. Um, so a lot of times it's, we have metrics, but we're still working on correlating them to show impact you know, broad organization-wide impact. Um, another really popular one is time to, well, 10th commit, if you look at Spotify's docs on this, but time to first commit maybe is also a good one. Uh, time till somebody can be effective, that's something to measure. Um, when we mentioned that in, in some of our papers, um, and then adoption, things like monthly active users. Um, I think a really interesting one here is surveys and interviews. Uh, most folks that we talk to believe that they get a lot out of qualitative surveys, um, but they're, they can be difficult to run. I can tell you we're trying to run uh, a broad interview uh, program now from, from the platforms group. Actually, come talk to us if you want to help us out. Uh, but it's pretty hard to get together and get everyone on the same page because you're not just trying to educate yourself as the interviewer. You really need, or the surveyor, you really need to get that information and share it with your whole team. Yeah, so that's on on measurement, how the platform team, you know, reflects their impact up to the C-suite and to other to other teams. Um, the next relationship, this is maybe is the, the one that you know we think of first, is the relationship between the platform team and the application developers. Um, and in this category, we have adoption and interfaces, kind of or this relationship type, we have adoption and interfaces, which are kind of interrelated. Uh, so again, here, I'll, I'll, I'll just read what, what we defined here for adoption. Why and how the users discover and use your platforms and your capabilities? Um, what makes them want to consume your platform? Uh, so here again, we kind of find that split between number two and number three where, you know, in number one and number two, it's more of, well, 
I something is forcing me to use this platform for some reason. Uh, extrinsic push, for example, means, um, you know, my boss says, if you want to get your bonus this year, use the platform the team is recommending. Or maybe it's more subtle than that. It's if you want full support for your database, then you need to use the database as a service from the platform team. Um, so I don't necessarily want to use it, but this is this is where the organization is going. Uh, we, we switch over to the intrinsic pull or even participatory where I'm contributing in level three. And there, like, for example, I was reading about uh, a an engineer that was providing databases, but they realized if we provide observability alongside this database so that when you use our database, you can see, you know, query metrics and other information traces for calls to the database, you know, follow all the way through. By providing that, I can give an intrinsic pull. I don't, I don't have to force users to use my platform. They want to come in and use it themselves. Um, and that's that that starts to create a flywheel effect, which we talk about a little bit in the in the guide. Um, participatory is is what I've seen there, or at least the starting point there is, for example, enhancement proposals, uh, letting people from other teams, that, at least that as a starting point, begin to propose what they need. Uh, and and feel ownership of the platform themselves. That's a that's a very far degree um, in terms of adoption. I've adopted it so much that I've made it my own. Of course, you know, in the open source world, we kind of understand that. Encourage that participation, make it your own. Um, so adoption does kind of correlate with interfaces, but interfaces to us, the way we were describing it is the way that your users come in and, and can use your platform. Um, so APIs, uh, well, the application programming interface, it literally is that kind of interface. Um, here's where we find things like Backstage uh, and portals. Um, you know, don't be confused to think that the portal is the entire platform, but it is a really important part of the platform. It can give you a consistent, you know, that's the first, I, I think one of the reasons why Backstage has become so discussed, so popular, is it's the first thing that, it's the first experience your, plat your uh, app developers, your users have. Uh, so we talk a lot about um, different styles of interface, APIs, CLIs. You know, in the in the early version, in, in, in the L1 and L2 level, standard tooling, it might just be ServiceNow tickets. At least, you know, try to bring some consistency around, sorry, it shouldn't, any kind of ticket. Um, at least try to bring some consistency around that. Um, but what's really interesting is when you get to the far right integrated services and what we mean by that is an interface that's almost that is hidden um, and that's you can see that with some of the service mesh stuff for example like where observability just you get it for free just deploy on our platform or identity uh, you know, automatically pull up, pick up an identity from the from the environment from the platform um, so we go from you know l2 standard tooling at least you have a consistent process for opening tickets or sending an email to self-serviceable solutions where I have to do a motion, but at least I can do it on my own. I don't have to wait. Um, and all the way to the point where I get the capability for free, I don't even know how it works. I don't have to do any sort of motion. So this is all about how the platform team and the application team uh, interact. And then finally, last but not least, this category was in the middle, but I, I put it last year, operations. Uh, and this is really about how the a platform team operates itself, how they interact with themselves and a little bit with their with their sibling teams. So how do we staff our team? We, we mentioned that a little in, in investment, but again here, how do we make sure we have the right people on the right projects? Obviously that's gonna be within operations. We talked a lot of, here about prioritization. Um, how How do, how does an organization track all of the platform capabilities that they have? Um, how do they make sure that they are maintained, secure, compliant, um, that they're life cycled? If you, you know, if you need to update one, that they're updated. If you need to sunset one, that they're sunsetted. How do you make sure the most important things are being done? Um, so, for example, I, I, I was helping a company one time and... They literally had like 10 or 12 infrastructure teams and you had to go to each one. If you wanted file stores, you went to one team. If you wanted a database, you went to another. You went to networks and firewalls, you went to another team. If you needed a server, you went to another team. And maybe that's pretty typical for, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, 
but it's pretty difficult to track priorities across your platform when you just have a bunch of disparate teams. Um, and so that we, we kind of go to in L2 here, we talk about centrally tracked, at least loosely coupling and knowing uh, where, uh, where all the different capabilities are being maintained. When we shift into level three centrally enabled, we have a central team which is saying, look, you got to adhere to certain standards. If you want to publish a platform capability, a new database type for the enterprise, you need to make sure it's got, I don't know, observability included. You need to make sure that it's got, you know, default configurations, golden path templates, let's say, so people can get started integrating it. So they start to put some uh, some guardrails around that. Um, I have seen situations where this can end up being a blocker. So you do have to kind of be careful that you don't take over all the work in the platform team. Um, you do, if you can, I, I guess this is dependent on organization, but you want to be able to encourage the product teams to contribute as well. I did have a situation uh, where I've seen a bottleneck essentially because only the platform team wants to build new capabilities for the platform and, and others uh, have to wait. So um, here in operations, we have, you know, the, the relationship of the, of the team with themselves and how they organize themselves. Yeah, so just to sum it up, I guess, let me take it back to the, to the maturity model as a whole. Um, we've got our five aspects. In each one, we've got a continuum of practices, which you'll find that your organization and other organizations, um, we, an we anticipate that a lot of organizations will find themselves, and that's why I have this pink line here, kind of at the L2, looking to get to L3 level. Um, and actually, you know, if you look at the top of the L3 level, it kind of says as product. When you, when you get to that L3 level, it really uh, starts to reflect platform engineering culture. Um, I'm, I'm providing value to my to my end users at, by providing, you know, my, my platform as a product. They're intrinsically motivated to come and use my product. Um, they are able to use it on their own. They don't have to find, you know, rumor-driven ways of actually getting what they need. There's a central team which is putting standards around it and everything is measured and we're gathering insights from it. Um, that would be amazing if you can get the level three. Yeah, so I just wanted to relate this a little bit to GitOps um, because this is after all GitOps con and of course GitOps is a, is a real key tool or a real key pattern to use in your, in your platform. Um, and what I think you know, a way, because I'm talking about relationships, I think a way that GitOps achieves this is by giving everybody one point of, uh, of truth in that Git repo, uh, where we can all see that, you know, and, and collaborate on the source of truth on what we expect uh, to be out there. Um, and in fact, you know, it was a revelation to me. I was giving a class one time and giving a workshop and I said something like, it wouldn't be so terrible to run kubectl apply at the very end of your pipeline. And that might be a little bit like GitOps, you know, if you don't actually have a GitOps, you know, controller of some sort. And somebody, I'm sure I just caused a lot of consternation with that, but somebody raised their hand and said, but Josh, you don't get the visualization, um, which was revelatory to me. Like I didn't think of GitOps as visualization, I thought of it as that same repo, but it was a good point. And that's why I bring up this picture Argo, I know there's been some cool other uh, visualizations showed uh, through the conference as well. Um, but here's, you know, a place where we can all see the current state and collaborate. I think that's one of the benefits of GitOps. So again, talking about relationships, um, GitOps is another way that we bring together everybody uh, in, in, in the cultural kind of way. So yeah, I wanted to wrap with this, uh, this whole earth coming together. Um, and in that vein, uh, I actually wanted to call call to action um, to say we're always looking in, in my tag, tag app delivery, which by the way, in our group, we have my working group, which is platforms. We have another working group working on artifacts, things like how do we bundle up these manifests into OCI packages? We're literally talking about that kind of thing. Um, the Ouija GitOps, or Ouija working group, GitOps uh, is also part of our group. Um, so I, I did put the maturity model. I think that that's what this, uh, 
this QR code here, if you want to take a picture of it, um, we'll, we'll send you right to the maturity model docs and the, and the platform doc that we created. But definitely come join our meetings. We're, we're, we're very interested in people's stories, whether you're, you know, a, 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 a contractor, a vendor, or an end user. Come tell your stories to us. Um, join us in the Slack channels. Um, you can join at Slack CNCFIO. And um, yeah, I would love to see you there and, and help us continue building the, the platform engineering in GitOps communities. And yeah, I'll, I'll pause there. That's Thank awesome. You. Thanks, Josh. Um, there is a question actually in the um, platform as well, if you don't mind. So it's, is there a standard model to quantitatively evaluate a platform along points you shared? Good question. Um, is there a standard model? There are a number of discussions. Um, for example, Dora, I mentioned, which talks about four key metrics like time to delivery. Um, there have been a couple other developer productivity frameworks or recommendations that have come out. I, I would recommend they've been published in ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery's uh, journal. So there's one called DevX, D-E-V-E-X, uh, and one called SPACE, S-P-A-C-E. Um, they're all capitalized, I think. And those are other frameworks for measuring developer productivity. Um, so far, that's kind of what we've, focused on is the, the same measures that we use for developer productivity um, apply for these platform engineering. Uh, but this is this is one of the areas that we want to explore together. So if you want to help us come to the group and we're, we're trying to understand how people are measuring beyond Dora and DevX and space. So um, looks like that's all the questions that are on the, the platform so far, but I have a couple. So what motivated the CNCF group to create the guidance you've created so far? Yeah, good question. Um, what motivated us? We realized that, you know, it, the motto of CNCF is make cloud native computing ubiquitous. And the way to do that is, or we believe the way to do that is by a consistent platform that makes app developers really be able to take advantage of cloud. And when we looked around, it was just a gap in the space to, to explain to senior leaders um, the value this could provide to them. So we really, that first paper was really for senior leaders to appreciate platforms. Um, so that's what really motivated it all. Then I explained before, like once, once we had that, we, you know, a little less senior leaders wanted to know, okay, you convinced my senior leader, now how do I actually do this? So that's, that's where we've been. And right now, like I mentioned, the interview framework, we're trying to get together to further verify. I mean, we've had a lot of people look at all this stuff, but we want to further verify and talk to people. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of been our motivations along the way. That's really awesome. Um, I think we'll wrap it up here, if, if that's cool with you. Um, and so uh, thank you so much, Josh. Seriously, it was a pleasure. That was a great session. Um, and we are entering our last block of breakout sessions. So I hope you enjoy the talks the rest for the rest of the day. Um, please come back here at the end and I'll just send, share some final thoughts and um, send off the event at that point. But thank you so much, Josh. We really appreciate it. Thank you.